You're listening to the Knowledge Archives podcast. Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast. We're a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines of knowledge as possible. I'm your host, Madhav Malhotra, and today I'm lucky to be joined by Dr. Mark Nielsen, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Queensland in Australia. His research focuses on the socio-cognitive development of children, as well as the roots of cultural cognition in the field of evolutionary psychology. I'm very excited to learn more from him about these two specialized fields in psychology. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to make it today and explain a little bit about your very interesting research. And I know that these are two very specialized fields of psychology that we're going to be talking about. But first of all, I'd love to just get a groundwork for that by talking a little bit about yourself. So would you be able to quickly introduce yourself and how you got started with this area of research? Sure. I am uh, an Associate Professor of Developmental Psychology at the University of Queensland, where I've been for a long time now. My primary interest is in you know, what makes humans different to, to all other animals, and what enabled us to do incredible things like you know, put a man on the moon and build towers and make iPhones and all those sorts of things. And what, you know, what it is that puts us there where other animals are just still doing things that they've been doing for hundreds of thousands of years and, and, and not much different. Why are we like we, the way we are? And that kind of drives a lot of the research that I do and a lot of the things that I'm really interested in. As to how I got here, it's without any intent or direction. I just sort of evolved out of interest in different elements of psychology. I sort of stumbled into psychology. I, I never finished high school. I went to, I dropped out of high school at the end of year 11 and you know, I was really interested in becoming a, a famous rock and roll star. And, and the fact that I'm not probably gives an indication of my ability. So I went to university as a, a mature age student and my intention was to become a marine biologist. And I just did better at psychology and enjoyed it. And I am still enjoying it decades on. Well, it's great to hear about that unconventional start. I don't think, looking at your research, uh, I don't think I would ever have guessed that with all of the specialized topics you look into, that you might have never even gotten started with this line of research. So that's really cool to hear about. And to get started with those areas of work, they seem kind of distinct from each other on the outside, but two very interesting areas of work. But why don't we talk a little bit about how they relate together? So when it comes to the branches of evolutionary psychology, you have been studying ritual behavior and culture a lot in the past little while, but then also you've been studying the development of children as they mature, as they become educated, etc. Is there some link between these two areas that isn't as obvious on the outside, but for you it's obvious like how these two connect? Yeah, look, they're actually much more closely linked than on the surface it appears. And one of the ways in which they're linked is is that we look at children early in life and, and when I say early in life, I'm, you know, talking from, you know, one or two years of age through to, to four or five years of age, when they're really, their minds are developing, their social abilities are developing, they haven't got entrenched ideas or certain behavioral patterns that have been shaped over the span of their development. And that can kind of give us an insight into what sorts of things are important in the early stages of life, because that kind of sets the foundation for what happens later in life. And whilst there's this old biological notion that's called ontogeny doesn't recapitulate phylogeny, that means that you can't look at the development of an individual as it grows up and say that that tells us about the evolution of the species. There is an element of that that applies here, and that is that we can look at what happens when children are young, and that can kind of tell us something about what might have happened in our evolutionary past. We often compare how children respond to certain cognitive and social tasks to chimpanzees who are our closest living animal relative. And when we do that, what we typically do is compare human children with adult chimpanzees. And, you know, we can look at where there are similarities and where there are differences. But by doing that, that gives us some handle on evolutionarily where we might have come from. So there are some things that I dabble in, which are just purely 
about children's development. In some cases, things like morality or ethics or things like that, which are not really put in, into an evolutionary framework. But most of what I do is, and, and when I look at how children learn and their capacity for imitation, I do that very much from an evolutionary perspective. I think that's really insightful to hear about. As I mentioned, those kinds of links aren't as obvious looking in from the outside of the field. So it's really cool how you approach the field of looking at how children develop and then are able to tie it to these other areas. And to get started with that, I wanted to ask you about some of the factors that are important to study. So as I mentioned earlier, I saw that a bunch of your research right now is focused on how culture evolves and can shape children. And there's a lot of factors of culture, but one that I saw in particular was ritual behavior. So would you mind talking about ritual behavior, how we can study it in children and see how it affects their growth, and then the evolutionary origins of that and where we think it came from? It's, it's actually really an exciting field to be working in because there hasn't been a lot of research done. It, it's a little bit of a puzzle in psychology that, that probably has its antecedents in political ideologies and the notion that things that are in some ways connected to religiosity are, are not the domain of science. And so psychologists have, have traditionally stayed away from studying religion and ritual and things like that. And, and we're really now just starting to, to do it. So it's a, it is a really exciting area to work in. And, and so why do we engage in ritual? What is it that makes something ritualistic? Why is it important to us? And as a developmental psychologist, when, when do children kind of begin to focus on ritual type behaviors as being something important and different to what we would call like functional behaviors? So we study it in various different ways. But one of the things that we do is if you think about ritual behaviors as something that has specific actions and movements and behaviors associated with it but the outcome is disconnected from those actions that might sound a bit obtuse but if you think about someone doing a dance to make it rain now they can tell you why they're doing it you know, i'm dancing because I, it'll make it rain but the causal connection between that dance and a raining is, is completely obscure so when we kind of try and take those ideas and, and look at you know how children process them we typically present them with something where there is some kind of goal now it might be like just getting a, a box open and we develop all these fancy test apparatuses that enable us to do this but it might be something similar just getting a box open but where it might be kind of obvious to you if you saw the box that the best way to get it open is just to take the lid off we'll do things like we'll clap our hands and then we'll take a stick and we'll wipe the stick across the top of the box and then we'll put the stick under something that allows us to, and you, know, you go through these quite elaborate actions, which as a cognitively able adult, you would look at it and I was to say to you, now, do you think these actions do anything? You'd say, no, they're clearly a waste of time. What we're interested in is, you know, if I do those things, will children do them? And what we find is actually they do. It's a really hard thing to kind of imagine and believe, but when you see it, it's very stark. And, and if, if your listeners know some children that are around three or four years of age, I'm sure you can get them to do it. It's really easy. You just get a box that they're not used to and take a stick that they haven't seen. So there's got to be some novelty to it and tell them you're going to open the box and just take the stick and, and you can tap your hand and then tap the box and then give the child the box and the stick and say, you get it open. And they'll do those actions. So from really early in life, we're kind of tuned into these weird and obscure behaviors that others do. And we, we copy them, and pun intended, we copy them religiously. And other animals just don't do this. You know, so there's been some really neat studies with, with again, with chimpanzees. And chimpanzees are, are very intelligent. They're, they're social. But if you show them how to do something, and it's obvious that elements of that process are causally irrelevant and they don't do anything, they, they just won't do them. You can do this by having boxes which are transparent versus opaque. So when they're opaque, you can't see what's going on inside. So you don't know if actions that are happening outside cause something inside. And those actions, you can do them in front of a chimpanzee and the chimpanzee will copy them. So it's not that they can't, it's not that they don't process them. But if you change that box to one that's transparent, where 
you can see what's going on inside and you can see that the actions on the outside are doing nothing to what's on the inside. Chimpanzees will just admit them. They just they don't bother because they're useless. Whereas humans will copy them very precisely. So it's, it's a really stark contrast between us and our closest living relatives, which is this habitual tendency to copy everything we see, especially those actions that are, are redundant and silly. Now, why do we do them? Well, they're a way of bonding to those around us. So there's, there's two kind of strands of explanation. I think they're, they're not exclusive, but conversely, they're actually complementary. So one is, is more of a cognitive interpretation, and that is that we grow up surrounded by so many artifacts for which the workings are thoroughly obscure. So I think I'm pretty good at driving a car, but I have no idea how the thing works. You know, I'm talking to you on a computer, which I think I'm pretty competent at operating, but I have no idea how this thing works. We have so many things like that, remote controls, electricity, you know, things that we just use in our daily life, how they function, we don't know. And with so many things like that, that we, we have to learn how to use, it just makes sense. It's just simpler. You see someone do it, you just copy them and you've got the skill. You don't have to worry about making mistakes or learning something and making errors. You've achieved it. So cognitively, it makes sense. But I think it's much, much more than that. As uh, authors Boyd and Richardson have, have categorized this as we're, we're ultra social. So we're not just a social species, we're ultra social. And we do things because others do them for no other reason than we want to affiliate, we want to fit in, we want to be like others, we want to be liked by others. And that's, that's really our strength as a species is, is our capacity for bonding together and working together to achieve outcomes. And, you know, one of the examples that I, I sometimes use when I'm giving talks or, or lectures is it if you or I were to be dropped in the middle of you know, the, the African forest and be confronted by a pack of chimpanzees, the outcome is not going to be good for us. They will tear us to shreds within a, a moment. Even one of them, they're just much stronger. We would not survive, but we could if we had a gun. And I'm certainly not a proponent of gun ownership, but I just use it as an example because it's something that none of us could make on our own. We couldn't make from scratch. You know, we require a whole host of skills and abilities that others that came before us have developed. But with that one apparatus, suddenly the tables are flipped. And I'd only ever have a gun because of my social interaction with others and because of our capacity for working together to pass on information and technology and skills. And that's what gets expressed in ritual. We engage in ritual behavior for, for social bonding reasons. You know, we do things to, to show others that, you know, I'm part of your gang or I want to be part of your gang. And it really is one way in which we can identify those who we want to affiliate with. But as far as where it comes from, you've got to go back like hundreds of thousands of years to, to our, our ancestors. And when we started making stone tools, once we started manufacturing stone tools and you can go back millions of years and, and we started making these things. Now, when our ancestors first started making stone tools, they're pretty simple, but they opened a whole new world for our ancestors. It meant that you could butcher a carcass very quickly, which meant that, you know, you are suddenly able to get meat where you otherwise wouldn't have. You can get it and move away. So you're not at threat of predation. It also creates a sense of, of teamwork. You know, you usually have to work with someone else to, to actually butcher a carcass. But when we move in, into our Homo erectus relatives, they started making what are known as Acheulean bifacial hand axes. And these are very specific, very difficult to make stone tools. And those of you who know them will, will be familiar with their, their teardrop shape, which is, is a, an unnecessary manufacturing process. And what we think happened is that as, as our erectus cousins kind of started to make these things, they possibly started to incorporate different ways of making them that identified different groups. And so ritual really, I think, is starting to be there in, in erectus and then more recently in, in Homo neanderthalensis where there's a stylistic and regional expression in tool manufacture. And I think it's from there that things have grown into the kind of weird and wacky rituals that we engage in today. I think that's a really amazing summary of how 
the behavior manifests itself in just say children and how we study that, but then going on to its larger effects on a group wide level on how it can be used to even distinguish different groups and then tracing that back all the way back to our evolutionary past. Thank you for that summary. It would also be very interesting to then take this point and then put it into the context of all of the other questions that you study in the behavior of children and talk about some of the other major questions that people often are curious about when it comes to the cognitive development of humans in early years and then what this kind of knowledge is used for. Yeah, so anyone who studies cognitive development, you're really investigating anything that has to do with the development of thought and thinking and the ways in which you interact with the world and process the information that you're exposed to. And so in terms of you know, what you can study, it is anything that spans human engagement and endeavor. And some of those things are, are more important to some people than others. So it could be things like language development. You know, how, how do you acquire the capacity to understand a sentence? It could be things like you know, mathematical skills, but it can also be things like Two of my colleagues here at UQ, Thomas Sudendorf and John Redshaw, study the development of children's ability to engage in foresight you know, and, and thinking about what might happen in the future and making plans for that. And where does that start and where does that develop? And then in terms of you know, how it gets applied, it, it depends obviously on the research. But one of the, the things that we try and do is, is understand what is typical development, what sorts of things we think children should be able to do at what ages in some cases and where it's done well it, it's you know is that different across different cultures that then can be useful to parents to educators to policy makers to anyone who, who's kind of interested in in ensuring best positive outcomes for our children at its extreme maybe even for, for societal change you know so some of my colleagues are really interested in moral development as a way of trying to improve our moral engagement with others um now there's maybe some judgment calls on, on that but you know it really is anything that you could imagine that relies on your brain processing information that's the sort of thing that cognitive development has study i was very curious about that actually when it came to how we can take these different factors that might exhibit how normal cognitive development looks and then analyze the social context of that, say in your socioeconomic background or the cultural context. And I'm guessing that this is especially relevant in Australia. I think I remember seeing some of your papers about how people often study Aboriginal cultures or people from lower income classes, children specifically, and how those kinds of environments might hinder their development. Is that correct? It's actually a little bit of the opposite to that. What we tend to do is not study those populations. And that's something that I've been arguing is, is really problematic for our discipline. And that's an ignorance of the diversity of the human experience. And we tend to and have traditionally studied what are really just white middle class children from Western backgrounds and assume that that's indicative of, of any child anywhere. And, and of course, that's just an absolute nonsense. So there really is a enormous gap in our knowledge base because we just don't study populations that, that are different whether it's economy or, or cultural background. You know, I mean, in, in Canada, you, you have an enormous richness of Indigenous culture there. I actually can't tell you of a single paper I've read that includes children from those kinds of backgrounds. Now, that's not to say they're not there, but, it, you know, and, and that's also not a criticism of Canadian researchers. It's the same here in Australia. It's the same in the United States. It's the same everywhere, you know, and... and you know, we've reported some of the data that kind of really bears that out. The vast majority of participants in our studies are, are from a very small portion of the world's background, almost none from, from Africa. You I mean, we don't involve other cultures where, you know, populations are, are much more representative of the world's population. I think from the, the middle of, of this century, it's projected that more children will live in Africa than anywhere else. And, and yet we don't know much about their development because we just don't study it. 
Now, there are some reasons for that, and that has to do with historical origins of knowledge and prioritizing certain views on on knowledge acquisition that are very Western-centric. But there is really a monumental need for us to almost stop data collection amongst white middle-class children. We we know enough about them. And to to expend our time and effort trying to to catch up to our understanding of how children in other parts of the world live and and develop and, and how their environments impact their development. And also because... You know, that there are problems with taking, you know, I said previously that one of our aims in, in, in developmental psychology and in cognitive development is to understand typical patterns of development. But that's, that's typical for a specific cultural context. So I might be able to tell you what a child here does at a certain period and what they should be able to do and, and when they might be ready for something at, a, at school. But that might be thoroughly different for a child who, who grows up in a different part of the world. And that has nothing to do with right or wrong, better or worse, more or less advanced. It's just different. But to take how one group of children develops and say, well, that's going to be our standard and then expect other children to follow that is going to end up in in tears. It's something that we really, I think, a gaping hole that we need to address in in psychology and not just developmental psychology, in psychology in general. Mm Mm-hmm. And that ties in very well to usually I wrap up the podcast by asking people about the gaps in research that exist in the topics they study. And then finally, I can see how passionate you are about this area of research and given this challenge, and I'm sure there are also many others, what are you personally just most excited to study in the next five years? The things I guess that I've been talking about, really excited to learn more about different cultural groups and how children in different cultures develop and and see their world and trying to understand those things better. I'm excited by work in ritual and how we engage with each other uh, around those kinds of very social attributes and, and, you know, why we do it and what we do it. And these are things that, you know, uh, are really just, we're just beginning to understand. And I talked about things like, you know, iPhones and, and putting people on the moon and our capacity for, for technological advancement and innovation. And, and we're really only just beginning to understand, you know, how we are able to do those kinds of things as, as a species. And, and I'm excited to know more about that in the next year, the next five years, next 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds amazing. And I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time to explain about the background with this really incredible discipline in psychology, but then also talk about some of the things that are on your mind, some of the things that you'll be focusing on with the research that comes next. And I think it will be very amazing to keep updated in this field and keep on learning more about what comes next. So finally, if anyone wants to learn about your work, where might they go? I am not someone who engages heavily with, with social media. So the best place is, is probably my, my webpage through the university. That's where, where my uh, papers can be found. You can also just hit me up directly, just email me. I'm always happy to respond to questions that people might have. But thank you so much for having me on today. It's been a real pleasure. I really enjoyed chatting with you.